This is Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny, a resource for the busy anesthesia provider and the only show dedicated to all things anesthesia. Listen in your car, at the gym, while you set up your room in the morning, as you cram for a test, or in your free time. A review of the ACC AHA perioperative guidelines, the initial treatment for drowning, meditation for health, how and why, epidurals reduce mortality in acute pancreatitis, and e-cigarettes aren't as healthy as we thought they were. This and more on today's episode of Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny, the only show dedicated to all things anesthesia. All right, welcome to Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny. Okay, let's get right into this. So for our first keyword, it's one of our basic keywords. And the keyword question is, or the topic is, ACC AHA perioperative guidelines. So the last guidelines were put out in 2014 and they help guide us um, on our decisions of what kind of um, uh, testing that we may need, how we may change antiplatelet therapy in our patients with various uh, cardiac um, issues. So uh, the first, I'm going to kind of talk about three different areas of this. Um, the first of which is a patient with suspected coronary artery disease or um, has risk factors for coronary artery disease. Um, the other one is, another one is how to address a patient on dual antiplatelet therapy. What do we do in a stent? Um, and the third kind of topic is a few different things, um, just other issues uh, that come up uh, frequently, or questions at least, with what kind of testing, like EKG, stress tests, things like that. All right, first, uh, one of the other good things about the uh, ACC AHA guidelines, if you haven't taken a look at them, is that they give you a really great flow sheets. First of all, there's a lot of great information in there, but there's great flow sheets to help kind of guide your thinking when you when um, one of these clinical questions presents themselves to you. All right, so you can see here, this is the first of those flow sheets. So a patient scheduled for surgery with a known risk factors for coronary artery disease. So if it's an emergency, then um, you need to, uh, you know, clinical risk gratification and proceed to surgery. So basically, um, get yourself ready in the room, make sure that, you're, uh, that you have anything available that you need, beta blockers, things like that. Um, um, and then the appropriate people are notified as well. Um, if it's not an emergency and the patient is, in, uh, is having acute coronary syndrome, then evaluate and treat um, according to the, the guideline-directed medical therapy. Okay. If the person doesn't have acute coronary syndrome, um, then you want to estimate the perioperative risk of major adverse cardiac events um, based on the combined clinical and surgical risk. Okay, and so you may ask, how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of uh, risk stratification tools online, um, one of which is the NISQIP um, risk stratification tool. And you can go to that website. Uh, it's www.riskcalculator.facs.org. Riskcalculator.f as in Frank, A-C-S as in Sam, .org. It's a great way to um, uh, figure out what the patient's risk is. And you can actually use this um, this flow sheet as well um, because it'll give you a percentage of their risk of major adverse cardiac event. All right, so um, if you do this uh, risk calculator and they are at a low risk, that means less than 1% risk for major adverse cardiac event, then there's no further testing needed and then you can proceed to surgery. Now, if it's anywhere above that, then they are at elevated risk and you have to move along, you have to move down the flow sheet. So. Um, if, uh, and the way that you do that is you ask them then next is you want to identify their number of METs. Now, four is that magical cutoff. So if they uh, have greater than 10 METs, if they're in excellent physical conditioning, no further testing is needed and you can proceed to surgery. Now, if they have between four and 10 METs, also no further testing is needed, um, but the, the recommendation is it's a class 2B rather than a class 2A. Now, um, if their METs are unknown or if it's less than four, um, then um, you're gonna, further testing will be needed. Um, and, uh, well, actually, what you wanna ask yourself is, is this going to give, or is further testing gonna change my management? If so, then pharmacologic stress testing is recommendation. If that's uh, abnormal, then coronary revascularization according to the, the um, guidelines is recommended. If it's normal, then you can proceed to surgery or you can look for an alternative um, therapy for whatever um, this uh, patient is having, whatever's going on with this patient. 
All right, so now moving on. So patients with um, a coronary stent, um, they come into the pre-op area, they're on dual antiplatelet therapy. What do we do with that therapy? What do we um, do? So what this flow sheet shows is that if the stent has been implanted in less than um, six weeks, then we want to know if it's elective surgery. If it's an elective surgery, we delay the surgery until the um, until after the optimal peri period. Now, with bare metal stents, the optimal period is less than or is 30 days or more. Um, with drug eluting stent, it is a full year, 365 days. Now, if it's not an elective therapy, then you can continue dual antiplatelet therapy unless the risk of bleeding is greater than uh, the risk of stent thrombosis. All right. Now, let's say that the stent implantation was more than six weeks. Um, then you have to ask yourself, is, if it's a drug eluting stent, is this greater than 365 days? Or if this is a bare metal stent, is this greater than 30 days? Um, uh, if, uh, yes, if no, then does the surgery demand you to discontinue um, these P2Y um, inhibitors? Um, if it does, then you can continue um, aspirin and restart the P2Y um, inhibitor as, uh, as soon as possible. If not, then continue your dual antiplatelet regimen. Now let's say that the, it's, um, the drug eluting stent has been placed uh, less than 30 days, um, or I'm sorry, greater than 30 days, but less than 365 days. So you're still in that window for, the, for rethrom uh, rethrombosis with the drug eluting stent. So if the risk of surgical delay is greater than the risk of drug eluting stent thrombosis, um, if it is, then proceed to surgery after 180 days. Now, if it's not, um, then delay surgery until the optimal period. So that's um, after 365 days for the drug eluting stent. All right. So now the next topic is other guidelines. So, you know, the patient comes to the preoperative area and, you know, you have the question, should we get an EKG? Should we get an echo? Should you know, just standard standard treatment, or let's say this is a pre-op or a pre-op clinic, and you're wondering, should I just get a standard? Um, uh, should I just get a standard EKG on every patient? Well, um, what this these guidelines say is that for EKG, no. So there shows no benefit um, to getting a preoperative EKG in asymptomatic um, patients with low risk surgery. So what about for the perioperative as, uh, echo? That also shows no benefit to routine assessment of the left ventricular function. Um, also, so uh, preoperative exercise stress tests. This also shows no benefit to routine um, screening for low risk non-cardiac surgery. Now, if you look at the guidelines, they actually go into much more detail about these, but I thought that these were really good, um, just concise ways to look at this. Um, but if you want the more detailed approach, definitely take a look at those guidelines. Um, and then beta blocker therapy. If they're on beta blocker therapy, then you should continue. Um, and if they are not on it, then don't start on the day of surgery. And the other one was, uh, sorry, I missed this, preoperative pharmacologic stress test. It shows no benefit to routine screening for low risk non-cardiac surgery. So it's the same thing as exercise stress tests. Our advanced keyword today is the initial treatment of drowning. Now 500,000 people will drown every year. And this is one of the most um, preventable causes of death in the childhood to teenage age range. Um, when a person drowns, a few things happen. Initially, their oxygen content starts going down. And either what will happen is that they'll have laryngospasm or they'll start gasping and coughing in training um, water into their airways. What that does is it um, causes an asphyxiation type phenomenon. Um, and that causes the respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. And so those things are important to remember when you're thinking about the initial resuscitation of a drowning victim. All right, so um, when uh, initially, um, the initial management of that cardiac arrest um, is to bring the patient to land is the first thing. Um, if breathing and unconscious, then put the patient in a lateral decubitus position out of concern for aspiration. So if they're breathing, oftentimes they've swallowed a lot of water um, and they may uh, regurgitate and that will kind of complicate things going forward. Now, if they're not breathing, then restore ventilation initially through rescue, rescue breathing. Drowning persons um, with only respiratory arrest usually respond to a few rescue breaths, all right? 
So you, when you start your uh, initial rescue of this patient, you start in the ABC sequence rather than the circulation airway breathing sequence or the CAB sequence. Starting with five initial rescue breaths followed by 30 chest compressions. Now the reason why five initial, initial rescue breaths have been um, said is that sometimes their the lungs are a little bit stiff um, because of any um, water that's been entrained rather than just the two initial ref, rescue breaths um, for most adult CPR. And then after that, you go with the two uh, to 30, two rescue breaths to 30 compressions um, ratio thereafter. Now, um, after uh, what they say is that active efforts to expel water from the airway by means of abdominal thrust or placing a person head down should be avoided because they delay the initiation of ventilation and it also greatly increases the risk of vomiting as well. Any victim that requires any form of resuscitation should be transported to the hospital for monitoring, even if they're awake, alert, and stable, okay? So if you've had to give them you know, extra support, you're gonna wanna bring them to the hospital. Now, for more information, I want you to check out the New England Journal of Medicine article entitled Drowning. Um, that's from May 2012, and it's by David um, Spilsman. All right? All right. For our personal health segment today, I'm focusing on meditation. So what are the health benefits for meditation, how to do it, how to fit it into your busy life as a practitioner? When I first started to meditate, I, I, I was completely doubtful. I didn't think that there's any positive benefit that can be gained from, from completely making your mind blank. But what I realized as I've looked into meditation more and more is that it's not about making your mind blank. It's about putting yourself in the moment, being very present, present into what's going on around you, what's going on inside of you, your thoughts, your feelings, and things like that. There's a lot of great research out there that shows very positive health benefits on multiple aspects of your life. Um, let's go through a couple of those now. So we know that it reduces stress, um, not just at the moment, but throughout the entire day. Stress reduction is associated with better sleep, increased blood pressure, decreased fatigue and cloudy thinking, and also in, uh, improvements in in irritable bowel syndrome, post-traumatic stress, and fibromyalgia have also been shown. Now it controls anxiety, now including job-related anxiety in high-pressure environments. So they did studies on healthcare practitioners and how meditation um, helps them throughout the day. Um, there's less depression. Uh, inflammatory cytokines associated with stress can affect mood and cause depression. Now on the flip side of that coin, it increases optimism according to a study measuring electrical changes in the brain. It enhances self-awareness, which helps uh, one to make positive changes. So if we're not aware of a problem, how are we gonna be able to change it? So meditation helps us gain a greater awareness of our thoughts, our habits, um, which increase our self-esteem and decrease loneliness. Now, um, there's improved creative problem solving. It lengthens our attention span. It reduces mind wandering, mind racing, worrying, and poor attention. One study found four days of practicing medita meditation may be enough to increase that attention span. So this isn't, isn't something that's going to you know, take years and years, months and months in order to, for you to see a benefit. You can actually see a benefit on the order of days. Um, and it reduces pain, the quantity, and the quality. Now there's two major types of, of um, meditation. There's one where it's a focused um, meditation, focused attention meditation, and the other is open monitoring meditation. Now, focused attention meditation concentrates attention on a single object, thought, sound, or visual, visualization, and it emphasizes ridding your mind of attention and distraction. Um, and then while you're doing the meditation, typically a person is focusing on breathing, a mantra, a calming sound, something like that. Now, an open monitoring meditation, that's kind of a free-for-all, it encourage, encourages broadened awareness of all aspects of your environment, train of thought, and se uh, sense of self. So you're an observer to everything that's going on around you and inside of you, which is kind of strange. You're observing what's going on inside of you. Now, it may include becoming aware of thoughts, feelings, impulses that you might normally try to suppress. Now, there's growing interest in the use of meditation in healthcare providers. There have been numerous articles uh, from the AMA highlighting this important um, resource as well. And remember, meditation isn't about posture, or position, or, or anything like that. It can be accomplished sitting, standing, laying, walking, running, any of those things. Now, uh, there's also numerous resources online for meditation. I found a great one on the New York Times website um, about how to meditate. What it does is it kind of goes through 
what meditation is, and it gives you different techniques for meditation. It's perfect for a busy healthcare practitioner um, who, who only has, let's say, one minute to spare because there's a one minute um, uh, meditation on there as well. So it's, the page is entitled How to Medita Meditate by David Gels, and it's awesome because it concisely presents meditation basics. And like I said, it has an audio which literally guides you through a one minute meditation. You click on a link, it brings you through a one minute meditation. And for a person with four minutes of time, if they have a luxury for four minutes of time, there's also a four minute meditation, a 10, a 15 minute meditation as well, and it guides you through it. So you don't even have to know anything about meditation, they'll tell you exactly what to do. And you'll start the healing right away. Um, anyway, so um, now the site is www.nytimes.com forward slash guides forward slash well forward slash how dash to dash meditate. Now, if you just search for New York Times how to meditate, I'm sure you'll find it that way. But I'll include the link at the bottom anyway, um, so you can find it there as well. On the current research, so one of the most promising interventions for reducing mortality in acute pancreatitis is the use of thoracic epidural. Now a multi-center observational cohort study um, published in Critical Care Medicine in March of 2018 was studying just that. Now the title of this study was Thoracic Epidural Analgesia and Mortality in Acute Pancreatitis, a Multi-Center Propensity Analysis. So here's the history leading up to this study. We know that there's 30% mortality rate in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. Now, altered uh, pancreatic microcirculatory blood flow has a major role in the pathogenesis. Now, uh, there's a systemic inflammatory response also, which induces pancreatic necrosis, regional complication, and distant organ failure. The mainstay of treatment, um, besides the removal of stones, if that's the cause, is analgesia, oxygenation, aggressive rehydration, and early nutrition and antibiotics if needed. Um, now, recent animal and human studies suggest that thoracic epidural analgesia may improve splanchnic and pancreatic perfusion. Um, animal studies show that there's an increased survival with um, th thoracic epidurals, reduced lactic acidosis, reduced hepatocyte apoptosis and sinusoid vasoconstriction, improved pancreatic and ileal perfusion, increased gut barrier function um, and renal perfusion, better lung hypoxic vasoconstriction response, and decreased plasma interleukin-6. Um, so those are all gr um, good positive things uh, in favor of thoracic epidural. Now in this study, here's what they found. They found that patients um, receiving epidural um, analgesia were less likely to develop acute mesenteric ischemia than those who did not receive the epidural. Um, now, the risk of all-cause 30-day mortality in patients with severe acute pancreatitis receiving thoracic epidural analgesia was significantly lower than that of matched patients who didn't receive the thoracic epidural. So the patients who received the thoracic epidural had a 2% 30-day mortality. And the people who did not have the thoracic epidural, who also had the severe acute pancreatitis, it was 17% of them had a 30-day all-cause um, mortality. Um, now, the use of thoracic epidurals in acute pancreatitis can um, be beneficial for patients both by providing analgesia, reducing the opioid um, use, but also by improving um, gut, splanchnic, pancreatic um, perfusion as well. Um, now, positive findings such, such as these definitely, uh, definitely support ongoing research in this area. On to anesthesia news. So hospitals uh, have communicated to the CMS that they'd like them to reconsider a proposed 40% cut in physician reimbursement. So con Congressional Quarterly reports that hospitals are urging the Trump administration to reverse proposed payment cuts to the industry. CMS wants to cut rates for outpatient clinic visits by 40%. Critics claim that the higher reimbursement is needed to offset the costs of additional regulations and overset, overhead in those clinics. CMS is expected to unveil a final ruling on November 1st. Now, e-cigarette aerosols uh, impair functions of uh, macrophages in the lungs. Reuters Health reports that e-cigarettes aren't as safe as some people would think. The report indicates that aerosols impaired the function of lung macrophages and caused them to produce inflammatory cytokines. Studies indicate that e-cigarettes are safer in terms of uh, cancer risk, but they still put the patients at risk for COPD going forward. 
Also, often uh, internal adverse event reports are used as roadmaps for litigation, according to Andis Robensky, a senior staff writer for the AMA. Um, now, however, an important ruling in June 28, 2018, by the First District Illinois App Appellate Court overturned a trial court decision on discoverability of internal patient safety data. This internal data, um, which is collected to improve safety within the hospital, has been used by lawyers against the healthcare institution. The old adage, no deed goes unpunished, comes to mind when thinking about this. This ruling is important because if the decision was upheld, um, was upheld hospital, hospitals would most likely decrease adverse event reporting out of concern that it would be used against them. So as for announcements, so there's a great resource on the American Society of Anesthesiologists webpage for important dates in terms of conferences um, uh, and different um, educational opportunities. So what you can see is if you click, um, go up under events and then click on current events, um, you can see um, that there are, they list a whole number of events um, here and you can kind of search for things by meeting type, by clinic topic, country, state, things like that. Um, and you can really see anything that's going on uh, in the world anesthesia and sign up for any of uh, these um, topics or any of these um, opportunities. Also, stay tuned for future episodes, um, for future special episodes of Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny, including the future keywords um, review uh, topic as well. All right, thank you so much for joining me again today for this uh, episode of Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny. We covered a lot of great topics here. Again, please, if you have any comments, if you have any suggestions for future episodes, leave them below in the comments. Please like, share, tell your friends about this so we can get the, the uh, knowledge out there to everybody going forward. Uh, and then we'll see you next time. Information disseminated in this show are for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your professional societies for the most up-to-date information on practice guidelines. Kenny's Anesthesia Circuit is a Vigilant Medicine Media production. Copyright Vigilant Medicine Media 2018.